Thank you, actors. Thank you so much. This is great, a nice base. Some very famous actors have sat on this stage, as I yes, understand. Yes, yes, they have. Have it's you ever been inside the no, actor's studio? No, I've never been no. inside the actor's studio. No, uh, I haven't. Well, this is your opportunity. I'll pretend yeah. I'm James Lipton. Yeah. I don't think I'll do <laughs> yeah. it very well. Yeah. But it is such a thrill and a privilege to have you here. Thank you. And I want to start, since we've all just seen Women in Gold, asking you what I think a lot of people want to know. How did you prepare to play Maria Altman, this real-life woman? Well... Um, there was some film of Maria. She did a long uh, deposition, and luckily she had just had a camera on her for the whole time. She, d she hardly spoke, but I just saw her reactions, and, and, um, and I got a sense of the power and the intelligence and the wit of the woman. Um, she was very, very, very remarkable, and I have to say, I, I don't feel I did her justice at all. She was, she was really something else. Um, so, you know, obviously, I don't, I didn't actually look much like her at all. You know, I, I made my hair look like her, and I wore the clothes that she would wear, but physically, I, I wasn't really very similar to her. But, but I think, I think the most important thing was that I had to put her memories into my mind because they're not my memories and, and the film is about her memories. So um, most of my work really was looking again at Holocaust material, at looking at history books, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, very important and extraordinary book, um, just to remind myself, or not remind myself, but try and put myself into those those days, those months, those years in Vienna um, at that particular period of time. So um, that was sort of the, that was, that was a sort of heavy work to do, but um, it was essential. And did you talk to people who knew her? She died before you were making the film, but did you talk to people who remembered her? A little her? bit, not a lot, actually, um, until after I'd started the film. And then Randy came to visit the set, um, one of her daughter-in-laws came to the visit the set. So I did meet people um, after I'd started. But before, no, I didn't, actually. Mm. And what about the accent? It's a very precise accent. Was that difficult? It's Viennese, to with, uh, not German. Um, I don't know if I really uh, you know, made a difference. But I had an actress uh, teaching me. Uh, she was on set. Daniel Broyle, who is also in the movie and is so wonderful, the German actor, he, um, he uh, recommended this wonderful uh, Viennese actress. And actually, she, she was a great dialect coach because she understood the acting process and um, she was wonderful. So she was on set for most of the time with us. Are you good at accents? Is that something that comes easily to well, you? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm actually, I'm not. <laughs> I've had to do a lot of accents. So the one I'm worst at is American, which is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, I've lived in America. My husband's American. My stepchildren are American. And I find, I find that really hard. Um, why is it? Why is that so difficult? I don't know. Uh, oh, <laughs> why? I don't know why. Um, uh, maybe because I'm so familiar with it that I, I, I've stopped being able to hear it, if you like. Um, I did work with a wonderful dialect coach here in here, who, here in New York, who uh, called Daniel Pardo. Have any of you worked with Daniel? He's fantastic. He re really, really good. Um, and he got, got me as close to it as, as I've ever been before. <laughs> but it was, certainly wasn't perfect. Um, but no, I'm not a natural sort of accent mimic. Some, uh, some actors are on, some actors aren't. And the ones of us who aren't just have to kind of work at it. Mm -hmm. So I know that you were just in the at the Toronto Film Festival. And you have two films there, which I'm sure everyone would like to know about. One was Trumbo, and you play... I play Hedda, Hedda Hopper. Hopper. Yes. The hideous, hateful, behatted <laughs> Hedda Hopper. <laughs> Do people know who Hedda Hopper is still? Yeah, yeah. Still okay. good. Okay. Good for you. You know your film history. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't know she was so political. Tell us about her role in this film. Oh, Tell she was. She was like Rush Limbaugh and, <laughs> you know, Donald Trump. 
hump. <laughs> and, and what's her name? That blonde woman, what's her name? Anne Calder, <laughs> exactly. All rolled into one unbelievable package. Um, no, she was very, very... Well, she, you know, she thought of herself as a patriot. And in many ways, and in that era, in that, you know, um, as, as indeed today, you know, she, the, the zeitgeist, if that's the right word, of America, she was sort of sitting right in the middle of what Americans felt and believed. So um, uh, she was very political and she was unafraid of expressing it. Um, that was one thing I admired about Hedda, was her fearlessness. Um, it, at an era when women were supposed to be polite and nice and and not challenging. She was very, very challenging. She called her house the house that fear built. <laughs> um, she hated Charlie Chaplin. Uh, she was responsible for Charlie Chaplin having to leave America. It was basically Hedda. Art wasn't the issue when where Hedda was concerned. Art was completely immaterial. Um, she saw, I think, the film industry very, very much as an industry, not as an art form. Um, she saw it as ent entertainment, and it had to be good, healthy entertainment, you know, uh, of the right political bent, you know. Which so, to her in, meant... An interesting character to play. So was she the villain of this piece? Yes, way? yes, she is. Do you like playing villains? Um, I, not really, you know, I, it's, um, no, of course, it's wonderful. It depends on the... <laughs> <laughs> you guys know, it's always fun to play a sort of an extreme character. But in, in, a, in a film that is about real life, I was, I'm always worried about categorizing people so um, simplistically as villain and hero. I, th I think the most interesting parts to play always are the ones who have a little bit of villain and a little bit of hero in them. In other words, flawed, um, complex, interesting people that you can't define in those way, in those terms. And um, uh, you know, I think our job as artists is to is to desimplify life, is to um, express the complication of life. Um, I, I, I see that as our role uh, uh, as artists. Anyway. And the other film is called Eye in the Sky, which just today was picked up for distribution by Bleecker Street Films. Oh, yes. It's yes. great to hear. I'm, I'm very happy yes, about so that. You, so yeah, you'll get that's to wonderful. See that. <laughs> that's wonderful. You know, when you're, when you're in a, a you know, small movie and, and, and you go into it, um, everyone goes into it, you know, crossing their fingers that we just hope it will get distribution without distribution before you start. It's always a bit of a, you know, nail-biting experience, um, especially obviously for the director and the producers. But um, I'm thrilled because I'm, I'm very... Um, it was a film I really wanted to do. It's about drone warfare and um, it's about one particular operation and it sort of follows it through in real time. And all the, manif all the different people involved in the operation, the politicians, the lawyers, the army, the pilots. Um, and it is true that nowadays these operations are, m are multinational. Um, but anyway, I, I, I thought it was a great script and it's turned into a really good movie. And you play a military commander, a colonel, is that right? That's right, yeah. Was this part written for a woman or... Not. No, apparently it was written for a man originally, but um, <laughs> <laughs> which plays into exactly what I've always believed, always. I've said, don't worry about writing roles for women, just point at a role and make it into a woman. <laughs> it's so easy. And, you know, so many movies, I often watch a movie say, that could be a woman, and that could be a woman, and that could be a woman. Um, I'm sorry? Prospera. <laughs> Prospera, yes, yes, yes exactly. exactly. Well, you know, that was... A, but, but, you know, just in, in any movie, you know, instead of William, you know, Wilhelmina. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, really, it's really simple. 
Well, the name that, that she yelled out is exactly what I was going to ask you about. You played Prospera in Julie Taymor's The Tempest. How, what did you have to do to reinvent that Prospero character as a woman? Oh, very little. Um, in the sense that I'd, I'd seen The Tempest a couple of years before I met Julie. Um, and and as, as, I, as I was watching it, uh, it was Derek Jacobi was in it, and he was wonderful. Um, I was thinking, wait a minute, this could be played by a woman, and you really wouldn't have to change anything. You wouldn't have to change a little bit about of the backstory, but apart from that, you don't have to change anything, any lines at all. The whole everything would work. In fact, I think it. I think it works better as a woman. I think the relationship with Caliban is more fraught, more, um, more guttural, if that's right, I can't think of the right word, but you know, it's more basic. Um, the relationship with Miranda, the daughter, as a mother-daughter relationship, it somehow seems less bullying than it does with this sort of patriarchal father telling her that she can't marry. A, a mother seems more wary of the you know, the, the potential dangers of relationships and falling in love and all the rest of it. Um, so I, I thought it worked terribly well. And, and um, anyway, so I met Julie, and she said, I'd love to work with you sometime. And I, I said, oh, God, I'd be so honored to work with you. And she said, well, what, what would you like to do? And we were at a, uh, at a party shouting. And I said, well, I think I'd like to do The Tempest. <laughs> Say, all right, that's what we'll do. <laughs> and then she went off and got the money for it, which was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, Shakespeare has been very important in your career, I understand, because didn't you start out early in your career in the Royal Shakespeare Company? Oh, yes, I've, I've played a lot of Shakespeare roles, yes. And is there more Shakespeare that you would like to do turning a male character into a Well, heroine? it's become it more ubiquitous, quite ubiquitous in, in Britain, even to the extent of Julius Caesar being done by an all-female cast very, very successfully. Henry V, you know, these plays that are so male, mm -hmm. you know, in, in The Tempest, um, I was playing her as a woman. I wasn't pretending to be a man. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the... What they did with the Julius Caesar, I think, was... They placed it in a woman's prison in the sense that it was women prisoners doing the play, which is an interesting concept, and it, apparently it worked very well. I didn't see it. Um, Henry V, and, and you know, our women have played Hamlet, but they played Hamlet as a man. Um, there's not a lot of the plays that you can just flip like you, cla like you can with The Tempest. King but Lear, could you do Queen Lear more easily? I, I, I don't think you could. I, may, maybe you could. Maybe you could. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I'd have to think about it. You have to sort of, you know, work it out in your mind. But, um, yeah, that would be an interesting one. I wouldn't like to have to lift Cordelia at the end. <laughs> 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 but most guys don't want to lift Cordelia at the end either. By the time they get to the end of that play, they're so exhausted, you know. See, that's something only an actor would think of. A critic would not think of that. It never crossed my <laughs> no, mind to say the lifting part is going to be literally heavy lifting, so never mind. <laughs> but there's something that you supposedly said when you were promoting the Queen, and I googled, I can't find it again, but it stayed with me, so tell me if this was actually the case, that when you put on the shoes, and got the walk down. That was the moment when it sort of clicked and you realized you could do it. Does that yes, sound? Yes, that, that is true. Yes, absolutely. Not yes. that the shoes mattered, but the, that was well, the, the moment when matter. it just really The shoes do matter. The shoes, oh, all actors know the <laughs> shoes matter. Okay. No, it starts with the shoes. Absolutely. Okay. No. <laughs> um, I mean, Greta Garbo used to do everything in slippers, mind you. Because, you know, and, and, and she was right there, you know, because you, you do get tired. But um, uh, uh, the shoes are terribly important in creating a character. 
what, what did happen when I played the Queen was I had my costume fitting and the costume uh, designer came, brilliant costume design, laid it all out, the, the shoes, the, you know, the walking shoes and the kilts and the barber jackets and, and I, I burst into tears. I thought, I can't play anyone who would choose to wear these sorts of clothes. <laughs> I can't get my head around it. I'm never going to be that person. You know, I can't do it. Um, but, um, <laughs> but then I did do it, and actually then I loved the clothes. So they were fantastic. It was so comfortable. Great. Do you often or always have that moment when you're playing a character when something kind of clicks and it falls into place for you? Oh gosh, not not necessarily. No, I mean, very often you're, you know, you, you feel that you're swimming against the tide and getting swept backwards as much as you're going forwards, um, and you don't really know. I don't really know whether things have worked until, if it's in a movie, I have the, I can see it on the screen. Um, it, uh, no, you, you, you don't really know. I mean, some, you know, uh, impersonation side of things. It, uh, and that, all, all of that stuff is very different. Of course, it's a part of acting, but it's only a kind of a comparatively, I think, a comparatively small part of acting, the sort of impersonation side. It's what people are, you know, kind of excited by, and, and it's like a sort of magic trick or something. But actually... The real work, as everyone in this room knows, is is not that at all. It's what's going on inside of your mind, and um, um, it, it's not the outward thing at all. I, you know, the great thing is when if the two come together in a, in a, in, a, you know, in a good way. And I think probably when I did the Queen, that did happen. But but it was the it's the inside story is much more important than the outside story. I think. Mm -hmm. So when you played the Queen again on, on stage in the audience, also written by Peter Morgan, was that a great advantage that you had played her before, or did you have to sort of unlearn certain things? You played her at various ages in the audience, of course. Yes, it's a very, very, very different piece. Um, no, it was an advantage, definitely, to have done it before. You know, I had the voice um, and the accent and all of that sort of thing. Um, uh, it definitely an advantage, but... I did have to go back, so, you know, I, I played her from 27 to 87, so, um, you know, that was a challenge. And also, I, going backwards and forwards, it wasn't sort of linear. Mm -hmm. You know, you started off at one age and you shot to another age and it came back again. So what is the best acting advice that anyone ever gave you? Mm. Gosh. Um... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't know because, um, you know, I've had wonderful actors that I've worked with who've who've really encouraged me and helped me and 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 given me confidence. And it, it's confidence above all, isn't it? We are none of us confident, and I'm still not confident. But um, any, and so therefore, anyone who gives you confidence, that, that's such an incredible gift as an actor, to be given confidence, either by another actor or by a director. Um, it's, it's a huge gift. So I'm very grateful to, the, to my actors, especially when I was a young actress, the, the ones who sort of gave me confidence as opposed to taking it away, you know. Um, but... The best advice for acting, I, I, honestly, I, I, I can't answer but that But what question. is the worst advice? Did anyone ever give you <laughs> terrible advice? <laughs> that you just said, no, I'm never doing that. I, I haven't had bad advice, but I've had some unbelievably bad direction sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> from, uh, from directors. So if you're acting with another wonderful actor, everyone says that really raises your game and it makes you better. But what happens if you find yourself with an actor who just isn't giving you anything or just isn't up to it? How do you deal with that as an actor? You know, you know I'm very unjudgmental about that because I discovered that 
actors have their different actors have different paces. Some actors, it takes them a long way to get to where they're going to. And other actors, I'm, I'm, I tend to be fast. I may be too fast, I don't know. But I, you know, if we're talking, talking in film terms, you know, by the fourth or fifth take, I'm sort of, I'm there, you know. Um, or actually maybe the second or third take. But um, other actors, and I've noticed this in rehearsal, you know, um, again, I'm quite quick in rehearsal. I'm sort of raring to go. And other actors are coming at it much more slowly. And sometimes, you know, third or four, fourth week in, you're going, are they ever going to do it? You know? <laughs> um, I never say that, you know. But, <laughs> but, um, but I've seen brilliant performances from those people where I was going, oh, you know, come on. <laughs> and then they turn up, then, then they do something so beautiful and so subtle. So um, I've learnt my lesson. And now I will give an actor, an, an actress, I like the word actress, the time they need. And I will just, you know, um, wait for it. Because... Um, as I say, we all have different paces, different time to get to where we're going. You said you like the word actress? I do, yes. Why is that? Um, well, because that's what I am. I, you know, I know doctor, doctress, and all of that sort of thing. But um, I'm an actress. I'm, I, like, I, I don't know, I like the term. It's kind of... Uh, it's rather pretty. I think of myself as sort of <laughs> someone at the, you know, Belle Epoque in, in Paris. <laughs> Je suis une actrice, you know. <laughs> well, I don't see the French. Do the French say acteur now? Do they now instead of actrice? No. 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 They say actrice, yes. Actrice. Je suis actrice. We have some questions from the audience. Um, Carolina S. would like to know, I'm modifying this. She asked what are the five biggest changes, but I'm going to change this to one. You only have to answer one. What is the biggest change or difference since you first started your career to now? Oh, goodness, the biggest. I, I, guess, I guess the role of women. And uh, in, in all the different contexts, in front of the camera, in front of the rehearsal room, um, Behind the camera, uh, in a, in in every way you can sort of possibly imagine. Really, I know we haven't gone far enough. Don't get me wrong, but I definitely that's the biggest change for me, mm -hmm. and one obviously from my perspective to be applauded and encouraged, and I take great delight in it. Well, the whole film industry has changed so much just in the last five or ten years with you know, independent films and being able to make them more cheaply, but mm. maybe having different kinds of distribution. Does that change the kind of advice that you would give an actor starting out in a career? Um, I don't know yet. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very exciting nowadays to see actors creating their own material. And that really didn't happen so much. Um, well, I guess we had actor manager sort of pe people like Laurence Olivier, but but um, but I think, uh, as you say, with the um, speed of the te te technicality, te technological side of things, I saw a wonderful film that had just been made with an iPhone. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful film. Um, uh, so, you know, that's incredibly exciting and, and it means that people can start generating their own material and, and um, I think we'll see more and more of that and, and I think that's a very exciting prospect for actors. So, most directors... Not much money in it, that's the only problem. That's true, there's this money. <laughs> most actors, directors, people who make movies or, or do plays, they have some work that really put themselves into, they just didn't find the audience that they thought it deserved. The distribution didn't happen or something. Do you have one of those, something that you think people, that you would like people to know more, that you think is undervalued? A film. Yeah, or, or a stage performance, something that you feel... I did a great play called Sex, Please, We're Italian. <laughs> And 
it was a very clever play. It was actually, it was a, you know, it was a, there, there was a play that ran and ran and ran in Britain called No Sex Please. We're British, wasn't it British or English? I can't remember. Um, but this was a sort of subversive version of that. And it was actually quite political and quite funny. And it was a farce. And I played this wonderful Italian sort of Sophia Loreni kind of character. And, um, and it went incredibly well in the previews. <laughs> audience absolutely loved it and then we opened this was in a smallish theatre in London then we opened and the critics absolutely <laughs> just killed us they were so horrible about it and from that point on we had like three people in the theatre it was terrible it was so devastating and I, but I always thought it was a funny very funny, very clever play. When was that? It was after I'd done the first Prime Suspect, so I was already kind of a you know TV star, if you like. So, well, I mean, I'd done a lot of TV before Prime Suspect, actually, in, in England. But um, uh, so it was around about then. I can't remember how long ago that was. So, doing Prime Suspect over a number of years, did you learn something as an actress going back to that same character? And she changed, of course, along the way. But did you learn I, something I, from I, that? Yeah, I learned just to, just to let it happen. You know, I learned to stop kind of overworking things. I, I mean, I was in an advantageous position there because I'd obviously played the character before and... I would always come at it with virtually no prep whatsoever. And just, so I just go, I just start and I just let whatever happened happen. And it gave me a freedom. I, I think so much of acting is about freedom, isn't it? I mean, there's my great inspiration for acting is a book called Interviews with Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon, the great British painter. And he talks about painting his art, and I found it so inspirational as far as acting is concerned, because he talks about the pain of learning technique, and technique is, you know, a any seven-year-old is a genius painter, any seven-year-old. They're all wonderful genius painters, but if you're painting as a seven-year-old when you're 14, you start looking like you're mentally, you know, <laughs> you know what, what's, ha what's gone wrong here. So you have to progress. And then you go, and this is how he describes it, then you go through this painful period of learning technique, learning how to draw, learning what paint does, learning, learning, learning. And then he says you come out the other side when you know your technique so well that now you can let go of it again and in, in a way become that seven-year-old painter. Uh, seven, you know, the seven-year-old, that you can access your instinct, your freedom, your simplicity, whatever it is, your soul, whatever you want to call it, um, but with the advantage of great technique. And he says at that point, you learn to recognize the good accident, what he calls the good accident, which is where you're slopping the paint on and there's a dribble, and you go, no, that's good. I'll keep that. Um, and I found that very inspiring as far as acting is concerned because we do, we all struggle with that process of learning technique, whether it's on stage or in the, in, in, on film or television. And then when you've got that technique and you know it backwards and now you can afford to let it go and let, allow the good accident to happen, you know, that's a magical moment. And I think that was what I learned doing all those hours of Prime Suspect, was I was learning technique of film acting uh, to the extent that then I could allow myself to be free. And I'm, I'm much freer now than I was at the beginning of that. Well, there's an audience question that's a little connected to that from Danny Lures, who wants to know, does your creative process differ for each role, or do you have a similar process every time you do something? I think it differs. I think it, d depending on the requirement of the role, really. Um, some 
like with Miria Altman that you saw tonight, as I say, it was very important to put her memories into my mind and have those memories front and foremost through every take, basically. Just put myself imaginatively into her world and what she'd seen and what she'd experienced as a young woman. Um, Prospera, I had to learn it. I had to learn it before I went on set. So I learned the whole thing. And I had to learn it really well. So there was no question of forgetting a word or a line. And that's hellishly difficult um, text. The Tempest is a hard text. So I spent about three months, you know, just sitting, learning it. So, you know, different, you just do, I think it just, it really depends on what the role is, what the context is. Um, I, it, no, it's not the same process, no. Well, we could go on and on, but I'm getting a signal that we need to wrap this up. So do you have any last bits of advice for all these actors? Oh, well, um, <laughs> I think be on time is good. <laughs> um, don't be an asshole. <laughs> Even better. And you know what I mean by that. Um, and um, uh, there was one other thing. Be on time. Oh, yes. Be nice to people. No, be nice to people. Because it's very true, you know. Um, I'm sure some of you have experienced this already, but, you know, you do meet people and they say, you know, I worked with you 10 years ago. And uh, you go, really? <laughs> Oh, yes, Ira, yes, yes, of course we did, didn't we? Well, sorry, what's your name again? Um, yeah, and then they say, you were great, you were so nice, you did this for me or that. And I'm not saying that necessarily, I'm not so sure. But um, it's very important to be nice to people and to encourage people and to make them feel good because that's what we are. What, that's, I know how good I feel when people do that to me. So I try to sort of... Um, do that for other people as much as possible, especially for younger actors. I think to encourage them and to support them and, and um, you know, give them a good memory. Well, it's been an absolute joy to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>